Good morning. And welcome to St. John. A few announcements. This Thursday, we have two different events Thursday night. We have our divorce care group starting up. So uh, please let people know if you think that'd be good. Uh, uh, group for them, divorce care Thursday night. Also, our, our once a month men's Bible study at Infinity Hall is this Thursday night. And we have President Dave Meyer from the Michigan District coming in. So, so please uh, uh, consider those two events. Also, our branching out golf outing is coming up. And uh, the golf outing is Saturday, September 26th. Um, but they like registration by this coming Saturday, the, the 12th. So please consider the, the golf outing. And I think you can, uh, there's a, a piece of our website. You can look at it, find it on our website. Um, I think that's about it. Today we're doing Divine Service 3, which is uh, what I call the old school service uh, from back in the red hymnal. And I hope you enjoy it. Now you can wait, turn and wave and <laughs> to your brothers and sisters.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. O God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion where you have dwelt.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you've promised. Make us love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from 2 Chronicles chapter 28. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded, and he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves? Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Certain chiefs also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshulamoth, Jehizekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadmai, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, you shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name rose and took the captives, and with the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them, and carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Galatians chapter 3. St. Paul writes, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to sing Alleluia.
the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. We read it together. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the gifts and the blessings you have poured out upon us. We thank you for that love which is boundless and that fills us in the midst of our weakness. We pray that you would grant to us your spirit, that we can hear again of Christ that love that has come to us, that we might be moved to a greater faith, and that by your mercy we might show forth your love to all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our epistle reading today, the Galatians had a problem. It's not how do they start their Christian faith. How do, it was not how do they walk as a child of God in the beginning. They understood that it was by grace. But the problem they had was how do I finally finish it? How do I reach heaven's doors? Paul had taught them clearly what he what God had said. But after he left the area of Galatia, other teachers came in and said, you need to do more. Because this is truly what makes you a child of God. Gave them a bunch of works to do. So Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. It's, when you read it, one of his harshest letters. And he says, no. If you began with the hearing of faith, do you think you're going to end in the works of the law? <laughs> it's not the way it works. And that was the problem the Galatians had. In the gospel reading, a dilemma was posed by the lawyer that came to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? In the first place, it's a silly question. What does anybody do to inherit anything? They wait for somebody else to die, and that's it. The second problem was, the text says, he came to test Jesus. He wasn't really necessarily seeking information. He wasn't seeking the truth of the word of God. He was seeking to stump Jesus, to show Jesus to be what many people thought him to be, an uneducated, wandering preacher. So he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I give Jesus credit. I know that sounds silly to say. But he doesn't argue about the, word do and inher the words do and inherit. He turned him back to the Scripture. What does the law say? And the man gave the right answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you're right. And that lawyer felt silly. And so he decided to test Jesus yet again. Who is my neighbor? See, the problem the lawyer really has at heart is the same problem the Galatians had. Is it law? Or is it gospel? Is it the demands of God that makes us a Christian? Or is it the fact that Jesus came for us, that keeps us in the true faith and brings us to heaven? So seeking to justify himself, he asks the question, who is my neighbor? Because it can't be all these people. Whom the one, who is the one I need to be a neighbor to? And so Jesus tells them a parable. And it's a familiar one for most of us, isn't it? It's the parable of a man going down from Jerusalem down to uh, Jericho. Now, it literally was a going down. It's a drop from about 1,200 feet to about 400 feet below sea level. And along the way, in the hills and the nooks and the crevices that make up the Holy Land, he was beset by robbers. He was beaten, he was mugged and left for dead. And the two religious people who should understand the God of mercy pass him by. But only one who stops is the outcast. It is the Samaritan. 
The religious people of that day would look at the Samaritan and say, there goes a heretic, there goes a false believer, a false teacher. He is the one we avoid. He didn't worship in the temple. He was kind of polytheistic. There was more than just the true God that would influence the way of his thinking and living and worshiping. And yet, it is this Samaritan, this outcast, this one rejected by people like the lawyer asking the question, who stops? He binds up the wounds. And then, not only does he take that time, but he puts the man who's half dead on his animal, and he walks the rest of the way to Jericho. And then... He works on his wounds some more. And then he says, here's enough money for a couple of days. If he needs more, I'll make good when I come back, knowing that he could be used and lied to by that innkeeper, but he is willing to do it for the good of that man. And Jesus says, which man was neighborly? And the chief excuse me, the lawyer answers, it was that Samaritan. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Do you see the point of the story? It's not just about being moral. It's something deeper. For the good Samaritan is Jesus. The neighbor who cares is Jesus. First and foremost, this is a parable about how do you get into heaven. If you begin by grace, you end by grace. Jesus is the good neighbor first and foremost in this parable. For what has Jesus come to do but to bind the wounds caused by sin, to heal the evil that is in our world, to take the hearts that are filled with fear or fear filled with trepidation in a world that has evil all around it, and he seeks to do nothing more than to do the thing that brings healing, to forgive sins, to comfort those who see and feel the wounds of the world around us. He's the one who comes day by day and brings us right here into this church to support us and bring the healing of our souls by hearing the word of God, to knowing Jesus better, to receive the bread and wine that strengthens us for this world and leads us to eternity. And don't make a mistake about it. Jesus was an outcast. He was rejected by all the people who were the leaders of society. Herod mocked him. Pilate thought he was silly. The Jewish religious leaders wrote him off as a crackpot. He was an outcast. He was the one rejected by the people. And finally, even on the cross, he would cry out to my God, to my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you understand what Jesus is saying to that lawyer who comes to him? He is telling him, my friend, it's about God's love and mercy in Jesus. It's about grace and care. He's telling the man, if you want heaven, you need to understand yourself as you really are, wounded and broken. Wounded by sin, broken by evil, whose mind is broken and corrupt that can't understand the way of God, and then you receive life, even as that man received life at the hand of the Samaritan. Now you want to be a neighbor? Well, now you can reach out. Now you can care, because it starts with Jesus caring for us. Do you see the importance of this parable? Because we have a problem today, don't we? Do we receive heaven by our own efforts? Or is it because of the work and the mercy of Jesus? On a personal level, there's really nothing more important to figure out, is there? So often we are like those Galatians, aren't we? 
That we, we know God started us along the way in grace, that he forgave us and brought us into his family, but then somehow along the way, the law starts to creep in, not to serve us, to, to, to guide us and to lead us, not even to point out our sin, but as somehow we start to think that the law will keep us in God's good graces. But the law and the grace don't go together. The law simply tells us our need for that grace. You see what's happening to us personally? We come together to do nothing more than to receive from Jesus. To be bound up and our, have our sins healed. To for, find those scars that are there because of the evil that has touched our lives. And to find those wounds healed by the blood of Christ. We come together for one reason. To receive forgiveness, life from Jesus to find new hearts that no longer serve to make it right with God, but because they, other people, are in the same boat we are. Do you see what's happening? We are in that parable, and we're the broken person, the person left for dead, but Christ has come for you. He's come for me. Do you understand what that means? that we can live humbly with the people around us, for we're all in the same boat. I always marvel at this church. It's a remarkable congregation, I I believe, but I'm a little biased about y'all. But I think it's something to look in the congregation and see people who are highly educated, people who aren't, people who work with their minds, people who work with their hands, to see us all together and to realize that as the people of God, we are gathered here in the same boat. People who who need that love, to need that forgiveness. And what that means is as we start to look at our world around us, we see people whether they be well-educated or not as well-educated, whether they be wealthy or be poor, who have the same needs that we have. They need to be forgiven. They need their wounds that have been cut into them by the evil of the world around us to be healed. What they need is for us to be like Christ to them. And not dislike Christ, but to bring Christ to them, to bring Jesus to them, because they have their own wounds of sin that they need to hear that forgiving word. And if we're uncomfortable speaking those words of forgiveness, we can do like the early apostles did, come and listen. For there here is the forgiveness of sins. It's the wounds of the sins of others against people that we can work to heal. For they are so great. They're the wounds of abuse and prejudice and racism. It's the wounds of of assumptions about how people think and act. It's the wounds that political ideologies have worked in our world. Those evils that are there find healing only in Jesus. And we are the ones, we are the ones in this world who bring the help they need. For we bring Jesus to them. For the message is never about you and me. The message isn't even about St. John. No, the message is about Jesus. For Jesus is the good neighbor. For he binds our wounds with the gospel. He strengthens us with the gospel. He feeds us with his body and blood in the sacrament. He reminds us that we have been born to him as we walk past our baptismal font. And then he gives us yet day by day by day the same gifts. For he grants us the spirit so that we can live as Christ for our world so that Jesus might be seen in you, in me, and that all might praise the name of our God. There is a problem out there. It's about law or gospel. Do we simply start off in the grace of God and end in the law? Do we simply work our whole way there? And the answer finally comes down to no. We live in the grace of Jesus. 
He came as a good neighbor to help us, to care for us, to save us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. To God alone be all glory. Amen. We rise for the offertory. be seated as we bring our offerings forward. Let us pray for the whole people of God found in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Father, your Son is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We are brought into your family by grace, and we will enter the heavenly home purely by grace. Help us always to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus that we might receive from Jesus the healing that we need and that we might be empowered to help others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, bless the mission and ministry of St. John, both our church and our school, that many might hear the gospel and believe and be saved. We pray for all those who gather here, especially this week, for Carol Gordelucian, John and Mary Gruber, the Gillis family, the Gus Fleck family, and the Michael Gutau family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our nation, 
our state, our cities and communities, including the city of Detroit. We pray for all those in leadership, that they might make wise and good decisions with integrity. And we pray for all law enforcement, healthcare workers, for anyone who cares for our physical needs. And we thank you for protecting us through them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our homes, that they might be places of the Word of God in prayer. We pray for our children, that they might grow and flourish, especially in the faith. And we pray that all married couples would love and honor each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, bless the sick, the suffering, those recovering from surgeries and injuries. We pray for Nancy, Margaret, Ruth, Dawn, Ron, Annalise, Ron, Jim, Nancy, Joyce, and all those we now name in our hearts. Father, heal their bodies according to your good and gracious will. And we also pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, and saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, 
Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. given for you, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins.
And now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you, body and soul, to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit then we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.